just for Palm Sunday. You're visiting. We're so glad you're here. If you're watching with us online, we're glad you're here and you're celebrating uh, Palm Sunday with us. We're going to get all sorts of details about what Palm Sunday is. We just got some background there, and we're going to be able to do it again. This message this morning is called An Ironic Coronation, and I think you'll see why in a bit. We're going to start with one of the seminal texts for Palm Sunday. We're going to be reading out of the Gospel of John. So John chapter 12, verses 12 through 26 is what we're going to look at this morning. It'll be behind me. If you have one of the bulletins uh, with you, you can see a link to it down here if you want to put it in your smartphone or device, or John is the fourth book of the New Testament, about three quarters of the way through a physical Bible, if you have one with you today. So we're going to read John chapter 12, verses 12. Here is how it starts. The next day, the large crowd had come that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that the, we are gaining, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as citizens of our great country, a modern Western liberal democracy as we are, we don't have a whole lot of experience with a good royal coronation, do we? <laughs> we may not even know what, what, what the word coronation means. We may not even be familiar with it. I kid a little bit, but you know, we have presidents, right? We have congressmen and congresswomen and senators. We don't have monarchs. That's what the whole Revolutionary War was kind of about, right? We want to rule ourselves democratically through representatives. We want to be able to tax ourselves, not ruled by another monarch who brings their own taxes on us. Our presidential inaugurations are still something to behold, right? We do a lot of pomp and circumstance and big flags are put up and all sorts of things like that, but it's not nearly what a royal coronation is like. So to help us out, I thought I would show a short scene from the great Netflix series, The Crown, which many of you may be familiar with. This scene is going to depict, depict the 1953 coronation of Elizabeth II, who is still, amazingly, the reigning monarch in England. I got some uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, hype in there, I see. Uh, this is depicted, of course, by the actress Claire Foy. Uh, the queen would have been 25 years old at this point when she was coronated. You'll notice a few things as you watch the coronation. You'll notice how Christian it is. You, watch, you go, holy cow, this is really Christian. Why? Well, because the king or the queen of England is technically the head of the Anglican church in England. They are like the pope for a uh, uh, you know something that tries to uh, get close to what what the queen or the king is in the Church of England. You'll also notice the priest who coronates her does a great job of portraying how 
kind of shocked he is that she's just 25 years old and she's becoming the ruling monarch. So let's watch this great scene and then I'll come back up in a bit. good as her husband watches on and says, God save the queen as he sits there. Well, did you notice the pomp, right? The circumstance, all the robes, the crown, the huge gargantuan crown. They all, all the royals have their own little crowns they put on at the right time, but then she's got this huge gargantuan crown. The royal garments they place on her. Each family member in the royal family is wearing some sort of royal garment as well. The priestly decorative garments the choirs singing in the background like angels kind of singing behind the scenes the linking of the coronation of the queen of england directly back to solomon being crowned in the old testament all the way back to israel there is just nothing at all chill about that coronation ceremony the whole thing is meant to evoke awe and wonder and to think this this is Holy, this is a holy and precious, significant moment. And then we turn to John 12 today, and we say a different type of coronation. As Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, there is so much anticipation that he is the one that has been waited for for so long that the people burst out, not God save the queen, but save us, Lord. They're ready to crown him at that very moment. But it's a bittersweet moment for Jesus. It's an ironic coronation because he's not coming as a conquering king as they desire. He's not coming in pomp and circumstance like the queen of England. He's riding in on a beast of burden. He's coming humbly. He's coming to lay down his life, not take up a war horse. But the crowds aren't here for that. They want the war horse king. But Jesus is a king who always brings us what we truly need most, not what we think we want. Here's our key takeaway for this morning. It is printed on the back of the bulletin. It's the main thing that we are focusing on this morning. It'll be right behind me as well. On Palm Sunday, the crowds went out to crown Jesus as king and ask him to save them. It's an ironic coronation because five days later, they will all abandon him while he is saving the world. See how that unfolds this morning together. Well, Every single gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospel accounts, they all contain some version of this story called the triumphal entry, usually just recognized as Palm Sunday. It's this account of what takes place just five or six days, depending on how you count, before Jesus will go to a cross. The fact that all four of the Gospels contain this story, it means it's a telltale sign. This is a big deal, right? <laughs> this is really important, okay, guys? In fact, all the Gospels focus on the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry proportionally far more than the rest of the weeks of his approximately three-year ministry 
combined. And the Apostle John in his gospel, if you're not familiar with, there's about I, is it 21, 22 chapters of John, but we're only at chapter 12, right? John takes half of his entire gospel just to focus on the final week of Jesus's life and everything that happens in there. And of course, what happens after the resurrection as well. This means the gospel writers are communicating to us Everything that happened in Jesus' ministry up to this point is, of course, immensely important and matters. But in the end, it can't compare with the work done in eternity, this final week, this holy week, culminating, of course, with a bloody cross and an empty tomb on Sunday. We pick up with John today immediately after two significant things have just occurred, if you read before our section here today. One, in the chapter before, Jesus has just raised a man named Lazarus from the dead. It's a crazy, awesome story. Jesus is at the end of his three years of ministry, more or less, here. So this resurrection, which was done in public in front of a bunch of people who were mourning for Lazarus dying, and he goes and does this huge uh, resurrection before a whole bunch of people, means there's a huge crowd that are like, whoa, this is awesome. Like this guy is raising people from the dead. They are, as the kids say, hyped about this. Okay. It's a lot going on. They're essentially saying, oh my gosh, this is it. Let's follow this guy. Let's see where he's going. He is clearly the one we have been waiting for. He's going to set up the Davidic kingdom forever now. He's going to kick out some Roman butt and free us from these people. We're going to get our country back. We're going to get our religion back. This is it. He is the one. Then immediately before this, Lazarus's sister Mary, in a very famous story, if you've grown up in church, you may be familiar with yourself, probably in an act of worshipful, worshipful thanksgiving to Jesus for raising her brother from the dead, breaks an expensive jar of ointment, essentially extremely concentrated and expensive perfume, breaks it over Jesus' feet. The effect, Jesus says, from this moment is that symbolically she is preparing him for burial. All signs at this point point to Jesus' previous predictions he has made publicly to his 12 disciples, telling them he is going to lay down his life for them, and not just for them, but for the whole world. All signs now point to that coming very quickly here. That's a prediction his own disciples have rebuked him for <laughs> and said, no, <laughs> that, that cannot happen. For how can the Messiah, how can the conquering Davidic king to come, the one sent by God, how could that one be killed? How could the final king to save Israel be snuffed out? Foolish thing indeed, most of the Jews would have thought at that time. But here's Jesus. He's healing the sick. He is teaching about the kingdom of God. He is demonstrating power over darkness and evil. He's raising people from the dead. Surely this must be him. He's got to be the one, right? It's with all this expectation that Jesus sets his sights on going into town in Jerusalem on the week of Passover, Passover, the week of the feast leading up to observance of the Passover. Jesus knowing full well what awaits him at the end of this week. And not just that, as the videos we watched mentioned and the text shows, likely hundreds of thousands of Jews from around the Roman Empire are in town for this Passover feast, for which many of our Jewish friends today, right now, of course, this week, if you come from a Jewish background or you have friends who are Jewish, they're getting ready for Passover too. It's coming up on Friday for them. So all these additional Jews in town would have had high messianic expectations at this point. Perhaps they'd heard about Jesus over the last few years. And as they come into Jerusalem, they hear whispers, he is the one and he's coming. He's coming into town. He's coming during Passover. So the fervor that is created at this time is 
unsurpassed. And as soon as the crowds of people see he has indeed set his gaze on the holy city, they are overcome. They grab palm branches from wherever they can get them, and they begin crying out, John says, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They are directly quoting a psalm they were all super familiar with because they sing it every Passover, <laughs> Psalm 118. You could turn there in your own Bibles, but you could also look behind me. In verse 25 says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. That's an English translation of the Hebrew, Hosanna. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This is one of what's called the Hallel Psalms. Hallel means praise. So Psalms 113 through 118 are a special section of these psalms meant to be sung, meant to be given as songs of praise in a corporate setting like this. And so any Jew would be extremely familiar with these. If you grow up in Hebrew school today, if you go to synagogue on and temple on a regular basis today, there's lots of them. We have lots of friends around here, of course, that do that. You would hear and be very familiar with these Psalms. They are especially recited during the Passover, during the Feast of Dedication. Later, they became associated as well with Hanukkah. Religiously observant Jews today and 2,000 years ago would be very familiar with Psalm 118. But notice, the crowds add an amendment of their own to this psalm, right? They add, even the king of Israel. That's not in Psalm 118. <laughs> What's up with that? Well, it shows what these people were expecting, what they were longing for, a new king, one who's going to set us free from our oppression. They want a coronation. They want a king. This is also a messianic identifier that they use with he who comes in the name of the Lord would have been recognized by people that day as specifically mentioning the Messiah, the sent one from God. They want salvation. They want a king. They want to be free from the Romans and their oppression. They want to be their own religious people again, right? They want their own country back, and they want Jesus to bring it for them. They haven't been free for so long, and all the promises of the Messiah are that a new forever age will come with him, a new age when the King of Israel will sit on the throne of God and will reign and bring peace, everlasting peace for the nations. And so they see Jesus. They see him coming into Jerusalem. And they see this age coming. They see their freedom coming. They are stoked. Hosanna, save us, we pray, Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. But what Jesus does immediately next reminds us of the type of king, the type of Messiah he was telling us all along that he was going to be. Look at verse 14. It comes right after what they said in John's gospel. And Jesus, in response, found a young donkey and sat on it. John tells us, of course, this is the fulfillment of a specific prophecy, the one we just read in Zechariah together out loud. And John quotes it directly so we don't misunderstand what is taking place here. But beyond fulfilling this direct prophecy, of course, made hundreds of years before, what else is Jesus signifying to us with this move in relation, especially in relation to what the crowds were chanting and expecting as he's coming into Jerusalem? Well, all the expectations of ancient kings in royal processions, entering towns, all those expectations and what they had seen with their own eyes or heard about in their own stories of history and in the overall Greco-Roman world, 
all the expectations were a king coming into town in a royal procession after a specific enemy had been defeated or an enemy that was about to be defeated, right? And a king would come in on a war horse. They would come in with pomp and circumstance, riding a war horse, ready to have already taken out oppressors or ready to go take on oppressors that they're going to fight. All the expectations for a king would be to ride in on a war horse. Solomon, one of the greatest principal kings of Israel, of course, was said in the Old Testament to have 40,000 stalls full of war horses ready for any time they went into battle, if needed. Had Jesus chosen to ride such a horse at this time into Jerusalem, no one would have mistaken what he was intending to do. You think that they're in a frenzy right now? They would have begun to march likely themselves, taken up arms and headed into Jerusalem and started taking out Romans and fighting them themselves if Jesus had chosen to ride a war horse. You could not mistake what that symbol would have meant. But Jesus will have none of that, right? What animal is he going to ride? What is he going to communicate to the masses of people who are clamoring for him to topple Rome, to rescue them, and to set up as a new king in Jerusalem? Will he feed into their fervor? He won't, of course. He tells his disciples, go get a donkey for me. An animal that is similar, right? It, 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 you can ride a donkey. I don't, have, I don't know this by experience. <laughs> I haven't even ridden a horse uh, myself. But perhaps a donkey is opposite in every other significant way from a horse, right? Horses are majestic. They are proud in stature. They are strong. They can be beautiful. You can train them for war. They are gorgeous animals in the end, right? Have some equestrian fans in the house here. Even today, the most valuable horses, right, can fetch millions of dollars, especially if they're bred for racing or some other purpose like that. Can anyone say any of those things about a donkey, <laughs> right? You can ride a donkey, but it's not exactly majestic, is it? It's not exactly a proud animal. You know, a lot of them kind of mope around and all furry and fuzzy and as you know stuff dirt and stuff gets stuck all over the gross animals strong right donkeys are strong can be stubborn known for that but not like a horse at all you're not going to find any ancient or modern army gathering up and breeding a ton of donkeys to ride in and charge into battle with yet here is jesus he says get me a donkey to ride into town on. Look what John, one of the 12 disciples who was present with him at this moment and was probably one of the ones who had these high war horse wanting messianic expectations that the other disciples would have had as well. John says, his disciples, we did not understand these things at first. They didn't understand in that moment. Why would the Messiah, why, why would the conquering king come riding in on a donkey? We want a coronation. He's given us a, a, a take it easy sign. We want a proud and victorious savior. He's given us humility. We want a war horse. He's given us a common beast of burden. We want him to threaten the Romans, but he's threatening our spiritual enemies. We want him to raise our country from the dead. He's raising random dudes from the dead. We want him to rescue Israel, but he's talking about the whole world. Jesus was indeed the Messiah as became clear after the resurrection, right? He was indeed a king to be coronated, but not in the way anyone at that time 
expected. It's a reminder today for us, 2,000 years later, that Jesus, not then and not now, will not serve any human agenda. He didn't do it back then as he entered Jerusalem. He won't do it now in his current reign as king in heaven. Jesus is no king, thank God, who is subject to the current opinion polls and how often they shift. He fears no inflation or economic pressure. Indeed, the threat of nuclear weapons, even to him, is no threat to his justice and his timing. There is no human agenda he must give in to. Thanks be to God. Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday is a reminder to us today. We may want an end to our hardships, but Jesus tells us His grace is enough. His power is perfected in weakness. We may want comfort, but Jesus tells us that if anyone would follow Him, they must take up their cross, die to themselves, and follow Him. We may want to work ourselves to the bone so we can climb up the ladder. Jesus tells us to rest and to Sabbath. We may want to get revenge on those who have done wrong to us. Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek, leave it to the wrath. God. We may want to get whatever the next big thing is coming out that we desire, but Jesus tells us to be generous with our resources and our finances and be careful how much money is ruling our hearts. Maybe we, want, we may want to hold wrongs against those who have wronged us. We may want to stay bitter, but Jesus tells us to forgive as he has forgiven us. We may want to please our spouse, our boss, our parents, our friends, our children, but Jesus tells us to make sure we are being careful to please Him above all others. We may crave all the likes on social media that we can get, but Jesus tells us to seek Him in prayer as the way to expand our platform. We may want to blaze our own trail, live independently, and just do me. Jesus tells us we need a community. We need others to help us, and we need to help others. The way of Jesus is different. It is different 2,000 years ago. It is different today. He is indeed a king, but his kingdom agenda is not ours. It's not any political agenda that exists in our country today or the rest of the world. And that is good news because his agenda is better than any earthly agenda could be. We see that in the final verses today as well. Look what triggers Jesus to tell his disciples that his hour has come, the time for him to complete his work has come. Verse 20, now among those who went up to worship for the Passover, for the feast, were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sure, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Once Jesus learns that some Gentiles, some non-Jews, some Greeks, that the nations are wishing to come and see him, he knows his time is near. This is what he came to do. He is not bringing in the war horse. He's riding a humble donkey to a humble cross so he can save the nations. Look how he says it, verse 23 and 24. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies... It remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
a clear reference to the cross and his death, which will come just five days from today. Jesus is a king, and this is his coronation. But his coronation didn't involve a crown of gold and jewels and precious metals like we saw in the clip from the crown. His coronation involved a crown of thorns placed on his head. His coronation didn't involve people chanting, God save the king. His coronation involved people shouting, mocking, beating him. If you're really the Messiah, save yourself. His coronation wasn't sitting down on a throne, but was being placed up onto a cross. His coronation didn't mean ruling with an iron fist over the nations, but bringing his life, laying it down to forgive the sins of the nations. And not just of the nations, but yours and mine. Jesus' coronation wasn't just good news for his ethnic people and his tribe, but for every ethnic people and every tribe and every tongue and every nation and you yourself, no matter who you are, no matter what story you come with, no matter what sins you have committed, he comes to lay down his life for you. Hosanna, save us, Lord. Ironically, in this moment, he is, but not the way they thought. Five days from now, all will abandon him as he's in the process of saving the world. And it won't start to make sense until Sunday comes and the tomb is empty. Let's remember today, this Palm Sunday 2022, what kind of good king he is. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm cognizant that if any of us, if I, was there on the road that day, picked up a palm branch, recited Psalm 118 in excitement of you coming that I wouldn't have understood what kind of king you were either. Lord, I would have probably cheered and celebrated and been excited and missed the whole point of who you are. But that's why we needed you, because we don't get it. We do not have it all together. We do not see clearly. I do not understand my sins are the greatest problem that I have and not my circumstances, and not the political realities around me, not what's happening in my country or other countries around the world. Thank you, Lord, that you came on Palm Sunday and then Good Friday and on Easter to solve the greatest problems that we have. Thank you that you came to die for my sins and for the sins of every person in this room and those watching online. Thank you, Lord, that that's offered to the whole world and that peace will come in your name today for all those who bow their knee to you and put their trust in you. And one day for everyone, you return and every single war horse and tank and missile and nuclear weapon is destroyed and there is no threat anymore Lord we look forward to that day but we thank you this day and remember you came to save and rescue us and to bring us what we need Lord help us to remember what kind of good king you are we pray this in Jesus name